All right, you ready? Let's do this. <laughs> Let's do this. <laughs> Greg, welcome to your own show. <laughs> it's How our, are you? This is our, this is our show. The, well, it's dialogue with Greg. Yeah, it's a conversation. Ford. I'm just facilitating it being dialogue instead of monologue. So, <laughs> right. Let's but, do this. but let's be honest, we all want to hear what you have to say. I want to hear what you have That's, to say, by the way. And at some point, because you've been asking me a lot of great questions and great conversations, at some point, I have a question for you. So you, Do you have a specific question for me now, or you're just saying at some point you'd like to ask me a question? I, I'm saying as part of this episode, I have a question for you. A pre-planned question? You already yes. have a question you want to ask? That's right. Would it be appropriate for you to ask it now, or would you like to save it for later? I think it's appropriate at any time. Okay. Because I, th it, it doesn't necessarily have any. I have no idea the topic for the day, so okay. Well, I don't know if it's on. Let, top. Let's lead with your question. Then. Okay. Go ahead. So I saw this thing the other day uh, on the internet, and I was curious what you think about it. Okay. Okay. So this is. Um, uh, it was a. It, it was kind of like this thing got very very mixed reviews, and okay. it was a couple that sent out invites to their wedding. And I'm, okay. gonna, I'm gonna slide this invite over here in a second so you can see it. Okay. So in, what they did was, instead of asking people to give them wedding gifts, okay. they said in lieu of wedding gifts, pay for your own meal at the reception. Hmm. So it was, like, it was like, hey, we want all of our friends to be there, but we cannot afford this meal. And so they're like, if you're an adult and you wanna come to the reception, it's 40 bucks. And if you have children under 12, it's 20 bucks. Interesting. And you don't need to bring us a gift, but you do need to pay for your own meal because we can't afford your meal. And so it was, here, I'm gonna slide this yeah, over. Yeah, let me see this. Super mixed reviews by people. Some people were like, that's super tacky. Can't believe they did it. And other people were like, that's genius, um, you know, that they did that. So do you think, Shailen Ford, <laughs> hot take, do you think it is tacky to ask people to pay for their own meals at your wedding reception or not? What do you think of that? Well, I think it would definitely be tacky if you were asking people to pay for their own meal and asking them to bring you a gift. Like, okay, okay now let's, let's not be greedy. This is ridiculous. But I think if you're in a position where you do want all these people that you love at your wedding, you do want to be able to you know, I, they, they end it, I'm reading it right now. It says, your presence at our wedding is the most meaningful gift we could ask for. And so I think when they're so specific- So you could come to the wedding, not come to the reception. You could. And not pay a dollar. You could. And and I, I think the fact that they've been really honest about, look, this is where we are. We can't afford it. Um, but we're not asking you to bring us something. We just want you there. We just have this huge group of people that we would love to celebrate with and we can't afford to pay for everyone to be there. I mean, would I recommend it becoming the norm? No, but do I think in this situation, especially because they so clearly have stated, this is like, this is the gift. Your presence is the gift. We just want you there. Like, so, I mean, honestly, if you're going out that night, you're paying for a meal anyways. Even if you're eating at home, you're paying for a meal. Like, maybe that's a little more than you'd pay for at home. But let's be honest, grocery prices these days, not tons less. So I, in this particular instance, I green light it. I say, I get it. I appreciate their honesty about it and that they specifically said, like, don't bring us anything else. We just really want you there. But it is... It is interesting. It is interesting. So here's my thought on it. I obviously don't know these people, so I don't know how tacky they are on a daily basis. Right. Right. So you don't know is that is, you know, is this just par for the course or is this very pure? It's like, hey, you know what? I don't right. need another. I don't need a microwave. I don't need, right. you know, a set of plates. I would rather have you there. Right? Yeah. And so I think it could be tremendously noble. I think if you were going to pull this move, you would have to predetermine that you are not going to hold it against anyone. No. who doesn't come to the reception. Because at some point, someone does the math, not. right? If it's the Fords, right? We're talking uh, $80 for the adults, $60 for the kids. So we're at $140. And so at some point we might go, hey, we we can't afford $140. Like we weren't mm -hmm. going to get you a $140 gift. We, we, we can't afford it or for whatever reason, right. we're not going to do it. And then we don't go. And then now you can't spend the rest of your life going, you know, they didn't even love me enough to pay for the meal at my reception. Yeah. So I think in some way, like, you, if you're going to do it, 
you've got to do it in a gracious way yes. to where you're not keeping score as to who paid for their meal and who didn't. Mm -hmm. And then I think you also could provide some sort of plan B for people around like, hey, we're going to have light hors d'oeuvres and you know whatever right yeah like pretzels Th and, that's you know, probably things that are what cheap. i would have done differently than them is if i couldn't afford to feed everyone a meal i would have done an alternative i would have done like a mid-afternoon thing and just served light refreshments instead of a full meal so that i wasn't having to ask people to pay for yeah. a meal um because i don't love that yeah. like like i said i get the heart behind it and and i don't necessarily it's not like I think it's wrong it's not like morally wrong yeah. but um but I think that that probably would have been the better option you know instead of but I, I get it I mean if if you're in a place where you go you know we we want to have this big beautiful celebration with everyone we want to you know have everybody dance the night away and we don't want to be done by four in the afternoon you know <laughs> two to four like you yeah. You have to pick and choose your battles. And you got to kind of tip your cap to somebody who doesn't, who's willing to admit, like, we can't afford to do what yeah. we really want to do. And like sometimes it, yeah, people, they're, they're too much pride, right? They're yeah. going to, they're going to rack up some crazy debt or somebody is to, to do something it's that they can't afford. So card. like in a sense, you know, yeah. there's, uh, you got to kind of tip your cap to that. So anyways, I, I saw that. I was like, I wonder what Shaylin thinks about this. I could see you going either way with it. And I was curious what you thought. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think they worded it well in, you know, obviously we didn't read the whole invitation, but it seemed like I was kind of skimming it over. It I'm seemed send like it to you here while you're talking. It, it seemed like they were not saying like, it's required. You're not getting in the door unless you whatever, but they were just saying like, Hey, you know, this, this would be helpful. So I'm sure if someone came to them, for example, and said, Hey, we can't, we can't really swing like $140 for our whole family, but like people probably would. 80. <laughs> I yeah. mean, I don't, you know, now you're getting into this weird bargaining thing, but I guess my point is, I think that if someone came to them and was like, look, I, I honestly can't swing to do that. Like we just won't bring our kids or we, you know, only one of us can come, whatever, then they'd probably go, no, like we really want you there. Uh, I just sent you the article in the, uh, and the the screenshot of the yeah. uh, the invite. So anyway, thank you for letting me take over your show here. For a <laughs> what do you want to What do you want to talk about? It, it is fun for me to be able to just bring this to you every week, and you genuinely have no idea what we're going to talk about. And then I just spring it on you and watch you go. Like people don't realize you just have all of that up oh. there all the time. It'll so be hit great. and miss. That's for sure. No, it won't. Go. It'll It'll be hit and hit. So, okay, so. Actually, one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about this week, um, because I had a conversation with somebody else on our staff about this recently, and it is something that we've heard you talk about before, but maybe not people on the show. Um, so one of the things that's, I think, uh, an interesting, I don't know how to describe it, and it's just an interesting question that you've uh, d gotten into before. Sorry, I'm so tongue-tied. I don't Sorry. know what the deal is. Um, but one of the things that you've talked about before is the idea of work-life balance. And so my question is, do you think work-life balance exists and why is your answer no? <laughs> yeah, I would say the answer is no. I don't think it exists. I, th I think you have to think of it a little more, I think in a little more in depth than that. Uh, I think it's a little okay. more complicated than that. So I think the illusion would be when you say work-life balance, you think about a balancing act, right? You think about a teeter-totter, right? That's suspended, you know, because the weight is perfectly distributed. So yeah. I've got... E equal the, amounts of time spent in every area. Yeah, the pie chart of my life is like, I'm just clicking on all cylinders, man. I've got my marriage. We're just spending plenty of yeah. adequate time. My kids, plenty of adequate time. I'm, I'm, I'm so, so focused at work. I'm super efficient, all this... I don't think it works like that. I think it's more like rhythms and seasons. So I think you have to kind of have systems in place and processes in place to step back, take a look at what's asked of you, what is yours to do uh, in those important areas of your life. So your your family, your marriage, your career, um, your own your own personal health, mm -hmm. um, and like the the things that you know you need to double down on that you got to hold on to and then the things that you got to delegate or let go of 
and then kind of reorder your life that way. So I think, and then realize like, hey, this season we're gonna we're gonna have to push hard to this point. So that means like, if we think of it in math mathematic terms, like if you think of a forty hour work week, okay, you go, hey, I'm gonna work. 60 hours and I'm as I throw this out somebody's going 60 that'd be nice you know I work 80 you know and somebody else works 30 but I'm just using it as okay as general rule right so if you say a 40 hour work week is normal um we're in this season here where we are reaping what we've sown and when the harvest comes in if we don't work extra you know it's gonna rot so we got to get after it so um there may be a season of time you're like hey we've got to work these extra 60 hours for one reason or another whether it's seasonal um, with your business or maybe seasonal with your family or, or like, hey, we actually just had this thing happen. We had a few people leave. And so now we've got to work uh, to, yeah, to complete the work. A few jobs. We got to cover their jobs and we got to go find new people for those jobs. So that's going to require more, right? So at some point you, you, you pull the rubber band that way and, and you're going to go, you know, 20 hours more. And at some point, once I get those people in place, once I get them onboarded and developed and trained and whatever, now I get some of my time back. And so I think what ends up happening a lot with leaders is they just keep pulling the rubber band further and further and further till it snaps. And instead of going, hey, okay, cool, we've, we've done that extra work, we're, we're, we're ahead now, and now I can actually, in this season of time, I can maybe scale back a little bit. Mm-hmm. Not that I'm gonna go back to 30 uh, hours forever, but at a certain point, if you don't kind of bring it back, catch your breath, get your mm-hmm. rest, you know, and have that season where, hey, I'm, I'm having a little more fun in this season. Yeah. I'm having a little more rest in the season. And, and, and doing that, well, then you're just always living at your rev limiter, you know. So I, I don't think work-life balance is, is, is a thing. You're just going to live in this constant state of everything suspended perfectly. I, but I, I think you have to have, have wisdom to know sometimes I'm going to – I'm going to go over the edge this way. Sometimes I'm going to go over the edge this way mm. and, and to make sure you're kind of, you know, working in rhythms and seasons. I like that analogy of the rubber band um, and having that flexibility because it is, I think sometimes you, you are stretched, you know, but just realizing when am I getting to the point where if I keep trying to stretch, I'm going to snap and it's time to go back. Do you, first of all, like we've had this discussion ongoing, we've been together, we just celebrated 20 years together. Um, and so this has been an ongoing discussion for us for two decades of like, how do we find that kind of balance in our family and and in our personal lives? So what are some like tip offs for you that maybe you're stretching too far and it's, it's like time to, you know, come into a season where you release the rubber band a little bit and and give it some rest. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think the tip off is just, you start feeling demoralized. You start feeling demotivated, depressed. All right, you're starting to go like, th- you know, for me, it's like I'll fantasize about retirement. You know, <laughs> I, I, all jokes aside, I do. I'm like, those retired people, man, they're the luckiest people out there, you know. And and it's like, okay, man, hold on. Like, yes, that there will be a time for that, but you're in you're in a great season yeah, of your you're life. You're in your prime right you're now. You're in your it's prime. Like, come on, like, you know, don't don't wish it away, yeah. right? So so I think like when I start finding myself feeling that way. I know something's off. One of the things that's helped me, this would be like a little bit of a tip maybe for uh, maybe somebody that finds himself in that place, is giving yourself something to look forward to that you know, you know, hey, th- this is kind of going to be the end of that, you know, season where we work that way or um, you, to have an end in sight and then to have some kind of reward at the end of it, whether it's a trip, mm-hmm. some time off, some time away, like something you're looking forward to and it's actually on the calendar. Yeah. Right. So, so a very practical example in our world would be like Easter, right? Easter right. is a huge time that uh, people come to church and we, we celebrate, you know, the, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus and what that means. And a lot of people who haven't been here in a long time come, and a lot of people, new people come. And so we want to make sure that we're hospitable to those people, that we give them a great experience, that we invite them to come back. Like, we want to make sure we manage that well. And this is a ton of work. Mm-hmm. We start planning Huge that. Steps. Yeah, we start planning that, like, frankly, um, you know, around. Before Christmas. Cr- yeah, before yeah. Christmas. Like, we're already thinking about Easter. As yeah. soon as the calendar turns, like, we're yeah. months out. You need hundreds of volunteers to pull it off. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a huge effort, right? Okay, so you've got all of that, and in the middle of that, you're 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 going over the the top, right? You're mm-hmm. working extra hours. It's like, you know, that's coming. 
it, it, at some point on the back end of that, you know, you're going to need to take a break. Yeah. What you don't want to do is get to the end of it totally uh, wiped out and not have thought about the fact that you're going to be exhausted, okay, before you're exhausted. Mm -hmm. So, so you, you probably in January, February, want to start thinking about what you're going to do in April and May as a reward for the end of that season that you mm -hmm. worked hard and then be able to pull back. And that's where I think from a leadership standpoint, you have to look at the, the team and go, hey, we're going to have to be able to like scale back without all of us falling down at the same time, yeah. right? So I remember a few years ago, um, I think it was Greg Popovich, who's the coach of the Spurs, and he had a, a team that was aging a little bit, like Tim Duncan and Manu Ginobili, and I think Tony Parker, and a bunch of those guys. So they were getting toward the playoffs. It was like a month or month and a half out from the playoffs, and he sent those guys home on a road trip. And he took a lot of heat for it because, I mean, these are superstar players. They're all-stars, Hall of Fame caliber players. And so people pay tickets in Memphis to come see these guys play. Yeah. And so people were like, oh, you cheated the fans. You know, you sent these guys home and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, he understood that, like, our whole team can't get tired at the same time. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these guys because I need these guys to be like spring chickens yeah. in the playoffs. <laughs> right. I can't have our whole team wearing out right. when, when, when it really matters. Yeah. So we got to be able to ebb and flow together. So what he did was he gave some of the younger players some reps, some minutes, mm -hmm. which by the way, you're going to need some of those younger inexperienced yeah. players in the playoffs, right? right? We're going to give them minutes now when, it, when the games don't matter as much. Mm -hmm. We're going to give Manu Ginobili, Duncan, and Parker a break. We're sending them home. And then when the playoffs come, we're all going to be back together. So yeah. you got to know like, okay, these guys work hard. Now they're going to take a Timing break, but these peaks. guys are going to step yeah. up. And that's where as a team, organizationally, we're always going to be clicking on all cylinders. But that doesn't mean everybody yeah. is running at all cylinders at all times. I, I love that. The idea of timing your peaks. I, I, it's interesting because when you were talking about like planning a break for after everything's over, I really think depending on how you're wired, some people a break before like right before the most intensity happens right so that you come in really fresh which yeah. is what, what those guys were doing i think depending on where you are as a person in your life your personality your your season of life that you're in some people it's a really good idea for you to take a break maybe a, a week or two before you know it's going to be the craziest mm -hmm. so that you can come in with a really fresh mind yeah. you know and and good energy to be able to hit that peak at the right time and then there are other people that are taking it on the back end yeah i think that's something that we have continued to tinker with personally over the years and i think we've gotten a lot better at i i obviously don't think we've perfectly nailed it but I think we're getting a lot better at finding okay what are the rhythms of like what times of year that we need a little bit more of a break where do we need to like gather our strength and our energy to head into this is about to be a crush we know what's coming we're prepared for it um, I also think your relational expectations of each other change in a scenario like that whether it's work relationships or personal relationships like within a marriage or even parenting where you go there are certain standards that we're going to hold someone to or hold each other to certain things we're going to aspire to in this season that maybe we recognize like we can't juggle all those balls at the same time during the crush. So we're going to let that ball rest right now. Um, I actually just heard that analogy used um, from a friend of mine on another podcast recently. And I, I thought that was really good. Like the idea that, you know, you have some juggles you can or some balls you can never put down you're always juggling those but there are others that can take a rest for a season mm -hmm. because you're adding a different ball and so i think having the expectation that like we are we are going to be more tired during the season you know we're maybe not going to have as much personal time during this season we are going to need more from the other person during this season um i i let me jump no, in real quick ahead. so i i think it's important particularly in in families to have a process, a rhythm where you're looking ahead because the, the mistake we, we both made for years was we started thinking about resting once we were exhausted. Yes. So we pushed it so hard, neither of us could get out of bed. Mm -hmm. And then we're like, 
hey, we ought to take a break. <laughs> right. And and so again, like. And then it's too late. Yeah. Like it's smart to rest when you're tired, but it's wise to rest before you're exhausted. Yes. You've got to rest before you're exhausted. And it's even wiser to look at your calendar and know when you're going to be tired, heading toward exhaustion and plan something, mm-hmm. a break of some sort, yes. right? To get your ducks in a row. So it's not like, man, I can't even move. And now I'm thinking about mm-hmm. taking a break. Yeah. So, so I think like that's from a, just again, just a organizational standpoint, like mm. looking at your life, ordering your life in such a way that, you know, that, that you're not waiting till you're exhausted before you take a break. Yeah. It, another thing that came to mind for me on that front was you and I have learned a lot from using the Enneagram and getting some, you know, understanding of just personality types and that kind of thing. Um, it's been a huge help for you and I to understand each other really well, um, to understand people that we work with and just work better as teams. And I I think that that even in the idea of rest and how much you need it and where in your schedule and uh, what type of rest is great for you, those are important things to consider as well. Um, So like, for example, I know you've you've talked before about a tip off for you um, when you're starting to get really tired. And I, I would love for you to tell it instead of me tell it, but you were talking about like, I know that I'm starting to get tired to a point that's unhealthy when I kind of enjoy like watching comedians you have kind of mean humor yeah. or something like that. Yeah, like, that's that's like emotional for me like emotional fatigue. Right. Right. So like physical energy you kind of know like dude I don't I don't have any physical energy. Which by the way just quick disclaimer like when I'm talking about fatigue I'm I'm not just talking about physical fatigue, yeah. emotional, spiritual, like yeah. all of those things are real. Holistically, you're going to have seasons that wear you out. So yeah. So uh, for me, when I'm emotionally exhausted, one of my, like knowing that I'm on a quarter tank, right? So like if I ran out of fuel in my car, that light comes on. Mm-hmm. It's like, Hey, you're starting to get close for me. Like being at a quarter tank is I start to have a desire to be mean. Um, when I'm energized, I don't want to be mean to anyone. Uh, I'm not super irritable, but when I'm starting to get tired, I, I want to be mean. Um, and then I'll start to live vicariously through mean people. Like whether it's a mean character in a movie, you know, I'm like watching the Joker, you know, and I'm like, get him, dude. Like, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I'm like rooting on the villain. Um, or, or honestly like mean comedians, yeah. like just brutal comedian. I'm, I, mm. I'm just like, yeah, dude, finally somebody said it, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, and I realize like, that's not, that's not good. Mm. And so uh, to me, it's a, it's a, a signal light that comes on that says, Mm -hmm. Hey, you need to reorder your life. You know, you need to, you need to find a way to get some emotional rest. And so, yeah, I mean, I've, and I've pushed it too far. Like it, you know, I learned that through the school of hard knocks of, um, letting myself get to that point at some point, then you, 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 you lose the willpower, uh, to be mature. Mm -hmm. And so then I have done and said things that weren't kind. And of course I, I would just, um, vindicate myself in my own mind around, well, it was true and truth hurts and blah, blah, blah. But the reality is like, it didn't come from a good place and it wasn't me at my best. And so, you know, it took some counseling, some coaching and some mistakes to finally come to that conclusion that, man, you need to be an emotionally healthy place and be the best version of yourself and and learn how to manage your, you know, your, your energy better. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I would say another, this is just like very practical weekly rhythm type thing for a long time I took Fridays off as my day off because weekends are such a heavy lift especially at that time you know we were doing Saturday night service so I would take Friday off because I wanted to have a good day of rest before I went into the weekend and then I wanted to get Monday you know get the first punch on Monday so I was so like a lot of people take Mondays off but I would get to work early on Monday because I wanted to try to get as much done as early as I could and Mm -hmm. and get a big win on Mondays. And it just didn't work for me. You know, honestly, Fridays, I didn't rest that well because I knew I had the weekend. So I had that like just huge boulder, you know, in, in my mind. And 
I'm running my message through in my head on my day off and, you know, I'm trying to, you know, process it with you or whatever. Um, and then Mondays I was wiped and, mm -hmm. but, but I tried to, but you were trying to focus, yeah. trying to go into meetings and you couldn't bring your whole self. Yeah. It wasn't yeah. good. It was that like diminishing return type yeah. energy. So I just like, you know what? I flipped it and I just said, Hey, you know what? I'm going to work on Fridays. I'm going to take Mondays off. And, um, I'm glad I did again. It, it was, it was just something that I found that at the end of Sunday, I could totally check out rest, do a Sabbath on Monday. And it was a game changer. So I think, I think some of those things like it's macro and micro mm -hmm. it's how, how are you doing your whole year and, and the seasons in your organization, the seasons in your family, Yeah, are we organizationally in a place? I really do need to be in those weeds. I do need to be in those decisions. Am I still in decisions I don't need to be in? Am I still yeah. in conversations I don't need to be in? Am I taking meetings I really shouldn't be in or I'm no longer required to be there and, and I need to reorder? So it's the big seasons, but then it's also down to how you do your days and weeks. Yeah. So I want to backtrack just for a second because there's like five different things that you just said that I want to take forward, but I want to take a step back before we go there. Because the whole reason that I brought up the Enneagram thing, I think you highlighted it perfectly was the the fact that like based on your own personal wiring your quarter tank light that you described where you know like man i'm running low and i'm not in my best headspace is going to be different you are an enneagram eight so you know I, and i encourage people if you don't know anything about the enneagram you know I, i'm not a coach i'm not trying to sell you anything but i'm just telling you it may you be you could be a coach by the way you'd be a great coach i i would actually love that you've I, kind of been I my no <laughs> you've been mine too we've, we've helped each other um but like i would encourage you to find some good resources on that personally um greg knows one of my heroes is suzanne stabile i just love her um the road back to you is such a great podcast um but anyways just uh and and some great books around it but it it was a powerful tool. The whole point is just finding a tool that works for you because that was a powerful tool for us to help understand, okay, based on your wiring, when you get tired, it's going to come out as this like intensity, right? Yeah. Well, you, you, you try to find something to burn fuel, right? right. So you've got to get going. So you got to burn something. And so for my personality type, the cheap fuel is anger, Yeah. you know, and so, and, you know, and that's where, again, the mean thing is like, to find something to get you angry so that you can get yourself up to go do what you got to do. Right. And for me, based on my wiring, I would tend to go into conservation mode where you would look for something more to f fuel your fire to keep it burning. I would go, how do I use the least possible fire, you know, if that's your resource, and, and conserve it for the things that absolutely need it. So I'm gonna wanna communicate less. I'm gonna be irritated by people asking things of me. Like I'm going to pull back. I'm gonna draw into myself. I'm mm -hmm. going to be, and that will show up in, you know, being irritated with people asking me for something simple. Like mm -hmm. that, and it, it's so dumb. It's, yeah. there's no reason for me to be irritated by this. But like, you know, I, in my head, suddenly now it feels like such a huge deal to hand someone a box of cereal, you know, like it's really not, <laughs> but it, it, you get to this point where you have nothing left to give. So knowing what your personal triggers are or, or your warning lights, I think is a really powerful tool. Yeah. And the more you know yourself, the more you're even going to be able to start identifying those and go, ah, I'm seeing this this is letting me know, like, I need to take a minute. I need to step back and get some rest. And I also think it does help dictate for you what, where in the flow of things you take your rest. For you, when you talked about flip-flopping Friday and Monday, Friday and Monday might have worked for certain personality types, right? Yeah. The way that you had it before. But the way that you're wired, because you're such a, like, go, 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 eye on the ball, you know, I, I can't handle the thought of anything being done without this level of excellence. You couldn't rest on Friday before you hand, headed into this big weekend and you had to deliver this monologue. And so for you, it was so much more effective for you to be able to go into Monday, regroup, and you still use Monday. Monday is our time. Like you and I usually go get breakfast and you start talking about next week's message <laughs> and, and, you know, and you start processing those things, but, but you could do it in a way that was restful and didn't feel like the pressure was on. All right. So I just had, I just connected a dot in my okay. head. Love it. So, you know, I, I kind of 
uh, lightweight obsessed over a lot of these like sports documentaries. Yeah. So The Last Dance. Or, no. Yeah. <laughs> I'm curious how many times you've seen The Last Dance. I don't know a few. <laughs> no, I, honestly, if you had to guess. Oh, I have no idea. I mean, I, I, I you don't always watch the whole thing. Yeah, you watch exactly. segments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you're counting each segment that you like, oh. if you're just counting number of times you've watched a piece. Oh, geez. 30. That would, that, yeah, Probably. that would have been my guess. Something like that. Okay. Okay. So the last dance, right. Which is the story of Michael Jordan and the, the bulls. And mm-hmm. then. Um, you know, I love watching stuff on the Kobe Bryant, right? Mm-hmm. And the Mamba mentality. And, and, and then last night we actually watched, uh, the, I hate Christian Leitner, um, <laughs> 30 for 30. Um, I think we've seen almost every 30 for 30. Well done. Pretty much, pretty much. We, we like him. And, uh, in the, the Christian Leitner one, for those who don't know who he is, I mean, he's one of the greatest college basketball players of all time, played for Duke, um, went to the final four, all four years and won two national championships. So they're talking about his personality and like all three of those guys, Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan, Christian Leitner, different players, but same mentality. And one of the things they would do is provoke their teammates. Yeah. All three of them had teammates that were, you know, their teammates were like, that guy was a pain in the rear end. Yeah. Like I did not like being around him. So like they would talk about how Christian Leitner would provoke Bobby Hurley, who was a little more easygoing teammate. And he goes, I'd get him so ticked off and then he would play so good. And he's like, buddy, he goes, I knew I had to, like, once I got him ticked off, he would go play like crazy. Same with Michael Jordan. All of his teammates were like, dude, this guy wrote us. Yeah. In fact, all of them were called bullies. Yeah. People called them bullies, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what's going on there, right? Because you look and and you go, is this just a depraved individual? Is it coming from a place of evil or something? And, you know, maybe, but like, maybe not. You, You look and you go, different personality types he might have been dealing with his own fatigue, right? He's tired. You're in the playoffs. You've gone through four or five series. It's been a long season. At this point, you played 100 games or something. You're you're in the NCAA tournament. Mm -hmm. You're emotionally tired. You're physically tired. And so part of what gets them up to play is anger and conflict. So what do they do? They make a conflict with the person around them. That's exactly And that conflict gives them fuel to go play, and they know... Bobby Hurley or Shaylin Ford in their personality type might go into lethargy and their lethargy is going to cost me. So I'm going to provoke, I'm going to get two wins. I'm going to provoke <laughs> her and I'm going to get her mad enough to move. And then yeah. in that conflict, I'm going to find juice to get up and fight the battle that I've got to fight. Yeah. And so I think you look at that. A lot of it is it's people would look and go, well, he's a bully. He's a mean person. And I'm not saying it's healthy. I'm not saying that's the right way to do it. But I think it's coming from a place where like Jordan would say on there, he's like, I was exhausted. Yeah. And at the end of fuel after they got, he was done. Bro was laid out. Yeah. He was tired. He was totally fried because he had pushed himself to, to the, to, to the absolute maximum of his emotional, physical, everything. Yeah. He shot, but he was shot with two games left. He mm-hmm. had to find something. So he took everything personally yeah. and he provoked he the got people that around shot him. of adrenaline and he shot it off in other people too, yeah. which by the way, brings me to something that I've heard you talk about a lot of times. And we've had extensive conversations around the idea of dirty versus clean energy, which I think yeah. that is a good place to, to touch on that because yeah. I mean, he was, he was, you can, you can use dirty energy. So if you think of it in terms of like fossil fuel versus yeah. clean energy, right? It's, it's wind turbines or something like that. Like the idea, and I'm not trying to get into that argument with anybody just before we even get into that. We're not, we're not going there. All right. This is not a energy politics. Independence. <laughs> this is not a politics <laughs> podcast. All right. But the idea that people will refer to one as dirty fuel versus clean fuel, right? right? Dirty energy versus yeah, the, clean the, energy. The stuff that goes up in the atmosphere and the it's stuff, not, the it's stuff not that's, circular. Yeah, the stuff that's pr- causing clouds of smoke versus the stuff that's... Killing the ozone. There you go. All right. So the idea that both things can provide equal energy, but at what cost, right? So personally, we are all capable of running on dirty energy and clean energy, but at what cost to you? So like break that down a little bit. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a great conversation. It's just probably 
we could probably just build the whole podcast on that. <laughs> we to could, be honest. But, but but I do think yeah. this is a valuable touch on. Yeah. Oh, I think so. So if you think, let, let's start with the concept of fossil fuels, right? There are things that are fossils. There are things that are from the past. There are things that are pushed down in the ground. There are things that, you know, when have crystallized under the surface yeah, and they're not and they, going anywhere. And they create a fuel that burns hot. It burns fast. It'll take you zero to 60 in no time. Um, but what does it do? It pollutes the atmosphere, right? It pollutes your atmosphere. It, it, it kills things like ozone and it's not cyclical circular. Mm. It's once it burns up, it's gone forever versus things like water, right? Hydropower goes up, down, it's, it's circular and it's sustainable. It's renewable, right? These are the buzzwords that we're trying to figure out how to power our world, right? But it powers our relationships. It powers our own energy. So I think like, like what I was referring to earlier, if you're in a season where you've got to dig deep and find energy and you're exhausted, a fossil fuel would be to find deep into your fears and your angers. Right. And, and again, what's under anger often is fear. Like, what am I afraid of mm -hmm. for, for take it, whether it's an athlete or a performer or a business person or whoever it is, um, if my fear is inflamed, it is highly energetic. Mm -hmm. We feel pretty safe in this room right now. If there was a danger posed in this room, we would move as fast as we could. We would deepen, yeah. we would dig into a reservoir of energy and yeah. be able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. So I think people that get used to doing that and every one of those stories I mentioned earlier, every one of them, when they do these documentaries, they dig into some of that. They do. They what? their own and other people's. They know how to trip their trigger. And and I think you nailed it when you said, you know, finding things from under the surface like that are usually backed by fear and that that will trigger you into action. When you have someone telling you that you're a uh, you know, an inferior player. Right. If you have somebody telling you, you don't have the guts, you don't have the grit, you're less than me, you're whatever, that's going to make people angry. And sure, they'll rise to the occasion. Yep. And they're going to hate you in the process. Yeah. So the clean energy would be coming from a place of love. It would be coming from a place of fullness. I'm mm -hmm. operating from fullness. Yeah. The, the concise way to say it is, it's the difference between needing to prove something and wanting to improve something. Yes. Well said. Two different things. Yeah. So the dirty energy comes from needing to prove something. And this is where you have a, a guy who's won four, five, six championships. And it's not enough. He, well, he's still, he, he, what does he do in his head? He goes, I got to prove this. Right. I got to prove the haters wrong. I took it personally. So I've always got a chip on my shoulder. I've always got something to prove. And that does give you, uh, you know, that does give you a shot of adrenaline. That does mm -hmm. give you a shot of energy. But when you live in that zone of always trying to prove something, um, that's, I think that leads you into dirty energy. When you're come to that place where it's, I've proven it. I've proven it to myself. People can doubt me. They can hate me, whatever. That's fine. I'm not even thinking about that. Now my life becomes about improving something. Mm -hmm. What is a cause? What is a project? Yeah. What is something so provokes my heart? that it's improving something. I'm putting something great in the world. I'm willing to do this, not to prove myself, yeah. but to improve that thing. And so now I'm working toward this cause and these people around me. And I think what happens is when you get so used to living off of trying to prove something and often you, it is very effective. Mm. It's very effective. It causes you to go the extra mile and to get things nobody else has. And I think people become so accustomed to dipping into that energy source yeah. that they don't even try the other one, which is if I could come to a place of security where I'm not doing this, trying to prove something, but I'm trying to improve something. I'm not doing it for approval. I'm doing it from approval. I'm not doing it because I'm empty. I'm doing this because I'm full. Right. And I'm operating from a place of fullness. Try that energy source. Yeah. If you get to that place, the, the, the cause or the work or the project itself is so compelling that it can pull your best energy out. And again, it's, it's more sustainable. It's yeah. putting you in a better headspace. It's certainly creating better relationships around you. But I think what ends up happening is people that live off that dirty energy usually end up pretty accomplished, pretty successful, yeah. and usually pretty empty and pretty yeah. alone. And, and the price they paid for it Right. Right. It may, may not be worth the trophy they got for it. Yeah. 
And, and I think that that is such a, man, when you think about that in the context of the conversation about work-life balance and the implications that that have, because how much more balanced will your life be if you're approaching each, each piece of it? And when I say balance, I'm not saying you're spending equal parts everywhere or whatever, but harmonious, right? Balance in the sense that each of the pieces complement one another and that you can flow well between them. When you're coming from a place of clean energy, in each of those areas of your life, they are going to feed into one another. You are going to have health come out of it. It's going to continue to produce more clean things. If I'm approaching my marriage from a place of clean energy, not where I'm just like doing whatever I have to do to get what I want out of you, because what is that doing to our relationship? Ultimately, it's destroying it, right? Mm -hmm. But if I'm pouring into the relationship because I just want it to be better, then it is going to improve versus I just got the reaction I wanted out of you or I got you to take the action I wanted you to take at whatever cost. Same thing within our work. If I'm in my workspace and I'm doing what I'm doing because I absolutely love it and I'm doing it because I believe that I have something of value to add to this space and I can improve on this area or I can improve on myself versus I'm in this line of work to prove that I'm worthy or you know that I'm my hustle's good enough, I'm big enough, you know? Mm -hmm. If I'm trying to prove something about my identity through it versus I'm just trying to grow as a person and I'm trying to improve the space that I work in, how much does that affect your life and the, the balance that it has? If I have a healthy approach to my work, it's gonna spill over differently into my personal life then if I need my work to validate who I am, it's going to overtake my personal life. Yeah. And vice versa, you yeah. see what I mean? Yeah. It makes all of those pieces work so much more in harmony when you apply that concept of clean versus dirty energy, which is why I really wanted you to touch on that. Cause yeah. it's just, it's I, powerful. I wanna, I wanna turn this back to you cause I've, I've got a question for you. So you're, you're the first person that I met who was afraid of success. <laughs> so like, I remember like having my mind blown cause I was afraid of, of, I wouldn't say even like failure, like making mistakes or something not working. Cause actually I, I don't have a ton of that. I, t I tend to be like, Hey, stuff's going to fail. Like we try it. I'm pretty like, if something's not working, my ego's not in it. I can go, Hey, it's not working. Let's quit mm -hmm. doing it. Even if it was my idea or my baby or whatever, like I can be done with it. Mm -hmm. Um, but the, feeling of like macro failure, like, man, I never got to my full potential or whatever. And so from day one, I can remember I was looking at what is a big life and trying to get there. Right. And so I remember us in a conversation one time and, and years ago, and you were like talking about you, that you're not afraid of failure. You're afraid of success. And I was like, what? <laughs> you what? psychopath. I was like, what? <laughs> unpack that. Like, I don't know what you're I, like. I had never even thought of anyone being afraid of success. Yeah. <clears throat> I was like, what do you mean by that? And you were like, well, um, if I succeed, success is like a monster and I've created this monster and now I got to feed it to this beast. Mm -hmm. And I'm afraid that if I create something so big, people are going to want it and it's going to want to live. And I don't know that I have the wanna will. Be beholden or the, to the beast. I don't want to be beholden yeah. to this stupid beast that's so hungry and I got to keep feeding it. Like uh, now I got to keep feeding it. And now I'm trapped in, in by this beast. Yeah. I'd never thought of that before. And I, but I think it does like it, um, line up with like your personality type, which is, you know, when there's too much, you go, there's the, there's the temptation of lethargy. I'm, I'm going to tend to feed off of, maybe dirty energy and anger. You might be tempted to go, I'm pulling back from everything. I'm not doing anything. Yeah. So I'm going to conserve. Conservation minded. So yeah. how have you dealt with that? Like, how have you yeah. figured out, like, I got to get to a better place because I can't mm -hmm. just, you know, go ahead and not succeed or I'm going to pick a small life or I'm going to give into the lethargy, but I also have to listen to myself. Mm hmm what have no, you learned? I, I, I think that's a good point of discussion. Number one, I think there are probably way more people that are afraid of success and just maybe have not had the proper terminology to even know that. Um, I actually just heard John Maxwell say something a few days ago. He, he said, the higher the success, the greater the price. And I think 
everybody thinks like, yeah, no pain, no gain. You, you know, you, it's, it's, a, it's lonely at the top, whatever. But like, no, no, really stop and think success does have a great price. And I think a lot of people are maybe not sober about that. Um, and so that's probably what I mean more when I say I'm afraid of success is that I, I have a very sober and pragmatic because I am, uh, for me, I'm an Enneagram 5, like my, my wiring is to really just think through all the logical pieces, right, and try to put together a coherent puzzle. And so I think about 10 steps ahead, what would be required of me if I achieve that level of success? What would it mean for my family? What would it mean for my day-to-day -day life? What would it take what for this to be, yeah, what would it take for this to be sustainable? Because I think the temptation is to just think about the mountaintop moment, and that's glamorous and beautiful and everybody wants that. But then what happens after you get there? How do you maintain at this new peak, at this new altitude, how do you live there and acclimate to like breathing that thin air? There is a price to it. Now, does that mean it's not worth pursuing? No, but I think you should consider it soberly. Um, for me, I think where it can tip into an unhealthy, like tipping of the scale the other way is that after I've considered the price, it can intimidate me to the point that I go, I don't wanna like, it could be this. It might not be, but it could cost me this. Okay, but also what would you gain? What would be the value that you would be putting into the world? What would be the value that it brings to your life, to your family's life? So I, I tend to just count all the costs and sometimes not also count all the value. I'm hey, by the way, you, you have brought so much value into my life with that because I am the opposite. We, I would be reluctant to start a podcast because I wouldn't want it to fail. You'd be reluct, reluctant to start a podcast because you're worried it would succeed, right? Like that's <laughs> yes. so, so like, but I have been so yeah. over the years, I've had the overconfidence and the, the, the idea that like I can pay any price. Mm. I can suffer better than anybody. Yeah. Well, you throw me in the middle of the ocean, I will, could. I will make it to the shore. You could. And so over the years, but, you but I would just throw myself yeah. into stuff having not really thought about the sustainable side or whatever it might be and and assuming that my energy was boundless and and frankly as you get older your energy levels go down yeah. you take on more you're taking on more and so you have done a great job of creating a proper amount of sort of drag on some of those ideas that at first I did not appreciate <laughs> I was like come on you know yeah. but like I needed that I needed and and I I've learned to really appreciate it to not see those questions as buzzkill questions, yeah. but seeing those questions I try as, not to be a Debbie no, Downer. but as, as being a good, healthy vetting mm -hmm. of an idea yeah. of what is this really going to mean for us to take this on. It's, yeah. it's always more than I think it is because I do tend to think in three and four steps and it's like, no, there's way more than that. And so it, it created conflict early on because, you know, I'm trying to go big and this and that, and you're going, dude, you, you know, that's more than what I want to take on. And I saw it, I didn't see it the same way that I see it now. Mm -hmm. So how, back to you, how have you taken those tendencies and learned to take the best out of them? And then what is the downside of that? And right. how have you learned to mitigate that? Well, first of all, that's where I think you and I are a great balance because you have helped me be more willing to step forth into things and go, man, it's worth it though. Like what what have you really gained by not pursuing this big, beautiful thing? You get one crack at this life and do you want to spend the whole thing just playing it safe? Yeah, so we I, can't just keep passing on everything. Right. Right. At some point, I, like, like we got to pick something. Right. And that's where I think you and I being differently minded in that area. And instead of attacking each other, kind of living in like the healthy tension there where there's a push pull and there's a give. Um, because then we bring out the best in each other. We found a way to find balance and, and like a really healthy perspective on this is a big lift. Let's get a really appropriate view of what kind of lift this is going to be. And then if we think this is really worth it, then let's go for it with everything we've got and not be afraid of what it's going to entail. So I think that's really, really good. Um, so back to your question. Sorry, I'm making sure I, I hit everything. Yeah, so the, the question was about, you know, 
the, the advantages of the way you think are that you really think the stuff out and you don't just throw yourself into stuff. Right. The disadvantages, so you can talk yourself out of everything. Yeah, I can aim and aim and aim and aim and not shoot. Um, and so that is definitely the disadvantages that I can, I can convince myself this this might be a monster that is too big for me to keep feeding and it will it will overtake my life. So what does it look like? When the reality is, it may not even, A, be a monster (laughs) and and B, it might be, you know, it's it's not a monster, it's a giant St. Bernard that you're like excited to have by your side. I don't know, it's a terrible metaphor, but you get my point. Like, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be this big, scary, overwhelming thing. It might be this big, beautiful thing that blesses your life like nothing else you've ever experienced. Why just view it as a potential negative? Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So what was the next thing you were at? Yeah, so just, so those are the advantages. So then how, what have you learned about, you know, not giving into that lethargy, but using your, using your fiveness, mm-hmm. using your analytics and your analysis to then go, is it helped you pick like be more selective about what projects you're going to take on. Like, yeah. you know, how, how have you, how have you taken it to your advantage and then mitigated, um, you know, the issues yeah. of your dis- the disadvantage, which could be in action. Yeah. Uh, I think one of the things that I've learned along the way is um, learning how to manage my energy reserves and, and to have a better sense of like, how much do I have? What can I do to maintain those and what, quickly drains them. So it's kind of like energy budgeting, (laughs) right? And so I go, okay, if I want to make sure that I have energy for these other things, then I need to do less of this. For example, on a personal level, you know, uh, there is kind of a, I would say, prevailing expectation of pastor's wives in general, that they expect you to kind of be this, if you are familiar with the Enneagram, this Enneagram 2, that you just are at everyone's house, you are the hostess with the mostest, you are, you know, out there like touching every person, you're arranging every meal, you're, you know, for someone that's sick, you're visiting. That's wonderful. And there are some people whose souls are absolutely fed by that. You know, they're, they're energized by just constantly being with people and doing those kind of things for people all the time. That is not my wiring. And I felt really guilty about that for a long time. But once I finally came to peace with it, then I realized, okay, how can I make sure that I can do for one what I wish I could do for all? Because I can't do that for everybody. I'm not wired that way. But it doesn't mean that I don't ever do it. So... I make sure that I have some time by myself or I have time to make sure that my own family is in order. I can support you in such a way that your energy can be bigger and you know you have more to take on. And then when we get to a place where there are some people close to my life that are in a crisis mode, I have reserve to do for them what I wish I could do for everybody. I have the reserve to be the one bringing you meals or having these long phone conversations with someone that is, you know, in a, in a really difficult place or dropping everything and having meetings. I have made space for that in my life and in my energy. Um, when it comes to big goals, I feel like I'm still working through that. Like sometimes I feel very clear. Well, I think, I think you're just now getting to the place where, um, you know, the nature of our family, you know, our kids, our boys are turning a corner. Yeah. Our boys are getting to a place where, I felt like I couldn't. Yeah, you could. Have I big mean, goals honestly, it was time. such yeah. a heavy lift that that now it's yeah. like the idea of taking on anything. You know, we talked uh, Sunday about climbing Everest, and you're like, should I keep climbing or should I turn around? Because I'm gonna, I could die on my way down mm-hmm. if if I don't hit the turnaround time. And I think, in a sense, like your instincts around, I have to, like, I can't delegate being their mom. Correct. I, I can get some help here and there, but like. I've got to have what it takes yeah. and, and the quantity of output now is it's changing. It's changing. From what it was. It's, yeah. it's changed a lot in for, the last for anyone, year. Yeah. For, so I guess we are kind of talking in shorthand, assuming that people know for anyone that doesn't know, we have three children. We have a daughter that's a teenager and then we have two boys that are 12 and nine and they're both on the autism spectrum. And so, um, our, our 12 year old is much more severe than our nine year old, although they both are pretty severe. They were, um, you know, our, our 
youngest went through a period where he was nonverbal. Um, both of them have had behavioral issues, and our oldest one has really struggled to the point that we couldn't even keep him in a school. Um, thankfully, by the grace of God and some amazing people around us and great support systems, great school system help, um, we were able to get him into a program that is life-changing for him. And over the past nine months or so, he's a different kid than he's ever been before. And and so, yes, the lift is getting easier. It's a different experience we now. We have few ba fewer babysitters quitting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, in, in tears. Um, but yeah, we so we, we are at this point now where we can do more things. And so that, especially for me, means I personally have more margin because there, like you said, are certain things that were mm. things really only I could do. And just even space to dream a little bit, space yeah. to evaluate, like, you know, to be creative, yeah. right, to, to do that. So anyway, and I, no, I, but I think that's a good question, Greg, because it, I think it could sound to someone listening, like people like me don't have big dreams or that we aren't, I do. I mean, you and I, you know, I, I, I did the Mrs. World thing, you know, mm -hmm. I, I went for that dream and I started for my state and went all the way through. That was a huge dream and I achieved it. Um, you and I have talked before for a while. I was considering like, do I want to try to swim the English channel? Like I was researching it and, you know, I was looking into it and, and identified who I would want as a coach and was thinking about it. It's too cold for me. I, I don't do cold that way. So no, you, you've done business ventures. But, <laughs> you've done, you've done lots. Yeah. Of so I, I, it's not that I'm not a dreamer and it's not that I don't want to go after big things, but I am so very mindful of the cost. Um, that success would have. Because failure, okay, sure, maybe you're a little embarrassed, you you didn't get what you wanted, whatever. There's not usually a massive cost to that. I mean, there could be if you were really irresponsible and maybe like had a huge financial gamble or something like that. But in general, I feel like failure, we blow it up bigger than our minds, in our minds than it actually is. And success, we tend to minimize what it would actually entail yeah. versus what it actually is. So I think, you know, we, we've said before when you're dating opposites attract, when you're married opposites attack, <laughs> right? Cause you're actually, now you're getting into real right. life, you know, you're really, you've intertwined yourself. Yeah. And I think, um, instead of fully valuing and embracing the tension mm -hmm. of these two ways of looking at things, often people just turn it into a fight or, yeah. or a divisive yeah. part of their relationship. I think, leveraging it to its full potential would be to go, Hey, we know we look at the world differently. One of us tends to, you know, shoot first, ask questions later. Uh, the other one tends to measure, 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 <laughs> measure, 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 don't cut. <laughs> and so to go, Hey, that's, that's how we naturally come to the table. Let's let the other person influence us. Right in one way or another and let's be as objective as we can yeah. and then make a decision together. Right. Yeah. At its best, I don't see you as, uh, slowing my life down inappropriately or just somebody I've got to drag along. I, somebody that's going to force me to answer questions that I maybe am not asking myself mm -hmm. and vice versa. Yeah. You're going, Hey, I can talk myself out of this because right. it is uncomfortable. But mm -hmm. growth is uncomfortable. Exactly. Growth is on the other side of your comfort zone. Right. And so this this nudging or this challenging that yeah. I'm getting uh, from Greg isn't um, isn't some sinister, nasty, immature thing. Right. It's actually a part of nurture yeah. of my life that's forcing me into a yeah. zone I kind of need to go. Yeah. And so so to kind of see it that way, uh, I think you get the best out of it Agreed. and the best out of each other. And that's Agreed. where two become one flesh, right? And this isn't just necessarily a marriage. It might be a family member, a friend, a business partner yeah. that come from different perspectives and to go, how do we get the most out of this? Yeah. And at its worst, okay, it's just antagonistic. Right. It's, it's just seen as a, you know, a, a villain and a hero. Right. And of course I'm the hero and you're the villain in, in those, <laughs> yeah, you know, everybody's or, 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 always the hero that's in their right. own story. That's right. I, I think that's really good, Greg, because, uh, one of the, one of the best ways that I heard that said was seeing things as a tension to be managed instead of a problem to be solved. And I love that because yeah. I think more often than not, we tend to see traits in other people as problems to be solved because it's not like ours. 
when the reality is it's actually a tension to be managed yeah. and it's a good thing yeah. because that tension helps keep either keep, helps keep both of you from going too far one way or the other that, that, on that, the spectrum. That's, that's to your question yeah. about life balance. Yes. All the way back to the beginning of the conversation. Yeah. It's not a problem to be solved. It's no. a tension to be managed. If you treat it like a problem to be solved, you'll try to get this perfectly balanced this life all the time. It doesn't work like that. that. Doesn't Pace is a tension to be managed. Yes. Should we be going 30 miles an hour? Should we be going 50 miles an hour? Should we be going 100 miles an hour? Right. Should we be going zero miles an hour? Right. You've got to be asking that all the time. And, yeah. and you don't just go, no, we're a 30 mile an hour family. No, because the speed no, limit not. changes depending on whether you're on the highway or country road. <laughs> it, might, it might be time, like we're driving too, too darn slow. Right. We need to pick up the pace. Right. Like, you know, it's time for that. Yeah. Or we might go, look, man, that, that, that 55 miles an hour, okay, it might've worked in the last season and this one, we got to bring it down to 25. Right. So you've got to have the rhythm of those conversations, the openness, and to sit in that tension, ask yeah. the question and make a decision. I love that. Well, I think that's a good place to just be done. I mean, do I, there's it. nothing else to be said. You nailed it. <laughs> All right. Well, babe, thanks again for a great, I shouldn't call you babe. But I'm, call me whatever you want. <laughs> Not, that, this thing's over. Far too intimate. We're done. All right. Bye. <laughs> See ya.